putting legs to your faith. It's the mission statement of Crestline First Baptist Church. And the, uh, we've talked about loving God. And when we say loving God, it, we also have to say right on the heels of that, hand in hand with that, is what Jesus said, you also have to love your neighbor as yourself. So to love God, in fact, John, 1 John says it, to love God means you gotta love your neighbor. If, in fact, if you don't love your neighbor, if you don't love your brother, if you don't know the person you, you know and have seen face to face, then 1 John says, how in the world can you love God? Because God is love. We secondly learned that we're, we have a responsibility of encouraging one another of coming alongside of each other, of challenging each other to become more like Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is the comforter, the one who comes alongside of us. And then as he fills us up, he helps us to be able to come alongside of somebody else, to encourage one another. Thirdly, and this week we are talking about, did I say fourth? Oh, well. Who knows how to count? (laughs) This week, we are looking at growing as Christ's disciples. Now, in order to grow as a Christ disciple, you've got to be a disciple. You've got to know Jesus. You've got to be a follower of Jesus Christ. If today you are a person who has not yet said, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, then that step is really important for you. And some of what I'm going to say today is really for you to watch the rest of us. Because to be a disciple of Christ should be that you're a person that people can look at and see Jesus Christ in you. So I urge you, if you're here today and you haven't made that commitment to Jesus Christ, look around the room and find somebody that has. Now, be aware that there could be somebody else and watch out who you put your eyes on because it could be that that person doesn't know Jesus either. But look for somebody who's a, who is a follower of Jesus Christ, who loves Jesus Christ, and, and you examine them. You put them to the test and see if Jesus is real in them. Now, if you are a follower, if you've committed your life to Jesus Christ, if you said, yes, I believe Jesus died, rose from the dead, he is the living son of God. He came to give us life. If you believe that, then the question you must ask yourself today, am I growing as Christ's disciple? Are you? Are you growing as a disciple? What's a disciple? A learner, a follower. Disciples in Jesus' day, you would follow, and this happens still today, you'd have a teacher, you'd learn from that teacher, you'd emulate that teacher, you'd spend time with that teacher, travel with that teacher, go through all kinds of experiences together. It's like my boss, the electrician, Steve Agley. The guy that shocked me up on a two-story roof (laughs) and almost jumped off. I spent something like three years with Steve eating watermelon for, and ice cream for breakfast. Uh, we, we, we'd, uh, we, we were out in Riverside and, and it was super hot one day and so we stopped and our lunch was a whole watermelon. <laughs> but I, I learned from Steve. I could watch his relationship with his wife, Anne, as they struggled not able to have children. Uh, I, I watched him... And, and you know, Sparky's, anybody been around construction? <laughs> Come on, who are the electricians? They're the, they're the really good guys, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> if you've been around construction, they're the nasty, dirty, you know, I mean, they're the bad guys, okay? And, but I've watched Steve not cuss. All kinds of trying experiences. Um, I, eventually, Steve... Um, left his business called Cow Sun, S-O-N, Electric, and he went to Jamaica. Some of you are, whoa, cool, Jamaica, sailing, beaches, blue sky, all that. He went there as a missionary, he and his wife, Anne. I learned a lot about God's love as I watched Steve Agley. I guess you would call me a disciple a learner. 
who learned from a man who taught me more about loving Jesus and loving other people. And he did that with his lifestyle. He did it as an example. And that's what disciples do. Disciples learn from someone and pass that on to somebody else. And in the meantime, they're continuing to grow and become more and more like Jesus Christ. Our text for today is Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. In order to kind of set the the stage for the text, because we're going to start, if we started right at verse 11, you're going to say, what? Well, let's read the first 10 verses, and then I'll pause for a minute. Hebrews 5, every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a priest before Abraham. Now that's interesting, right? Because that's before the covenant. That's before the sacrifices. You can study Melchizedek in Genesis and you might want to look him up to learn about him because look at the very next verse that he says. We have much to say about this, about what? About Jesus being the high priest, about Jesus' perfection, about Jesus' submission, about his obedience, and about how he is a high priest under the order of Melchizedek. And that is a very significant thing. And the writer of Hebrews is going to go on to say, now, we would really like to spend some time talking to you all about that, but you're not ready for it. Look at what he says next. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. Anybody here? (laughs) In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Anybody know what scotch emulsion is? No one here had scotch emulsion? It's a form of fish oil. It's white, really thick, And it is gross. (laughs) And I don't remember what we had. I think it was measles, but I'm not really sure. But, But everyone in the family, one after another, as we got sick, we got to drink scotch emulsion. And it was like you had to take, I don't know, it felt like you had to take a whole bottle. It's probably a teaspoon. It had to be more than that. Because finally what my mom did for me to take the scotch emulsion was she mixed it in vegetable, in some kind of juice. It was still gross. I mean, think about this. White fish oil. Okay. Ah, Okay. Some some of you have had an upper GI. Or is it the lower? It's the upper one, right? It's the upper one where you get to to drink the barium stuff. It's that bad. Okay. It's that bad. Scotch emulsion is horrible. Now, here's the thing. I had to take baby food to get it down. What's the writer of Hebrews saying? 
some of us are still on baby food. Yuck. We were at some kind of party recently, and I think it was some kind of, yes, it was. It, was, it your, was it your shower, the baby shower, where you guys had baby food there? <sighs> you know, that's disgusting. They make people taste it and figure out what flavor it is. Oh, my goodness, I don't even want to look at it, let alone taste the stuff. <laughs> I, what are we doing to these kids? Well, guess what? <laughs> That's what they can handle. That's what their mouths can handle. That's what their stomach can handle at that moment. They're on baby food because it's appropriate for them. But it's not appropriate when you've grown up. Where are you spiritually? Are you growing as Christ's disciple? Are you still caught in eating the baby food, the milk? And that's what he's, how he's using the term milk. Now, come on. Some of us drink milk still, yes? Hey, if you don't drink milk, at least eat ice cream, okay? Just... <clears throat> See, what, what the writer of Hebrews says is people need milk because they haven't grown out of their infant stage. People need spiritual milk because you haven't grown out of your spiritual infancy. You may have accepted Jesus Christ and said, yes, he died for me, I believe that. But you haven't moved past that. It's one of the reasons why, and watch out, I know I'm supposed to step on some toes today. It's one of the reasons why some of us use the response, I don't know what to say, so I can't tell anybody else about Jesus. I wouldn't be able to answer their questions. What's really troubling is when that's a person who's been in a church for 30 or 40 years, they go, I don't know what to say. Really? Stop trying to say anything then. Be. Be a Christian in front of them. You, 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 did you see what happens here in the text? He says, we have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because, and the NIV in my version says, because you're slow to learn. Hmm. It, another version says, because you no longer try to understand. <laughs> here, the, the literal translation, because you're dull of hearing. You know, kids, right? <laughs> what, mom? I didn't hear what you said. <laughs> well, guess what? How many of us are that way with Jesus where we are not hearing? Hebrews 6 verse 12 says it this way. We do not want you to become lazy. Same word for slow of learning. We don't want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been, a pro been promised. People need milk. Because we're not trying to understand. We're lazy in our hearing. He goes on, the writer of Hebrews says, we, we ought to be teachers already. Really? How many of you feel equipped? You don't have to raise your hand. You could go teach a Bible study right now. You know, in fact, if I called on you right now because Virgil wasn't going to be here and we're going to do a Bible study, and I said, I need a teacher right now. Go teach it. Would have a knowledge of the word that you could teach a Bible study. Well, look at this. If you're no longer a baby, you should be a becoming what? A teacher and able to teach others. In fact, he uses the word, you ought to be teachers. This is a should. This is something that, that we definitely have this ability to do. But instead, God tells us we need to be taught the elementary truths. The writer of Hebrews is so concerned about what's going on in these people's lives. He's, he talks about this a couple times. He says, he warned them at some length that they are in danger of repeating the unbelief of the Israelites in the wilderness and failing, therefore, to enter into spiritual rest that God had promised them. Why? Because they're still based on unwilling to learn, unwilling to teach. And he goes on, he says, you ought to be, you ought to be teaching about righteousness. What's the test of maturity in Christ? Becoming like Christ. Are you applying the word of God to your life? You see, when you leave here, do you go look for ways to apply what scripture we've read this morning? The application of the word, it's not just about the knowledge, is it? It's about doing it. 
Matthew 13, 43 says, and the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let him hear. What did Jesus say to the churches of Revelation? He kept saying, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Do you have an ear or a lazy ear? (laughs) I had a lazy eye when I was growing up. In fact, I went all the way through college and then found out that I needed glasses. And I had an astigmatism in my left eye. And basically the optometrist said, your, your eye's shutting down. It stopped functioning. You don't need it anymore. And it was literally, he said, you could go totally blind in that eye because it was, the, the brain was no longer looking for the signal from it. A lazy eye, do you have a lazy ear? Are you working to apply the word of God to your life? Or do you just come listen and leave? Sometimes I get concerned about what I preach. Not only will I have to give an account for what I do here in this place and how I shepherd the people, but I get concerned because if you don't obey, not me, but if you don't obey what the word of God says, what is God going to do with you? And if I am putting more judgment on you because I'm pointing out sin and and we're not doing anything about it, I get concerned about that. In the same way on the outside, you appear to people as righteous. But on the inside, Jesus said to the Pharisees, so no one here. You are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Paul said in Romans 2.13, it is those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight. It is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight. It is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. We went through our spiritual warfare process, if you will. What was one of those words that stood out to us? My friend Virgil has said it many times. One of our sins is disobedience. Next week we'll talk about sharing Jesus. This morning we're we're looking, in fact, we're called to make disciples, right? How are we doing? Because if we're not obeying that, that's disobedience. The mature, finally, Hebrews says, here's the mature. They can distinguish good from evil. And not only that, but their distinguishing of that enables them to teach others also. What did Paul say to Timothy? Entrust to faithful men. What you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. It's four generations that Paul's covering all at once. There's probably um, four things that kind of stand out to me as we try to distinguish what we're supposed to be teaching here. Number one is, I heard about Jesus and I believe. Where are you, by the way? I'm going to give you four positions. I heard about Jesus and I believe. John 3, 16, God's love of the world. He gave his only son and whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Do you believe that? So you pass number one. Number two, I followed someone who was following Jesus. I followed someone who was following Jesus. Paul says, follow my example. Can you do this? Follow my example as I follow the example of Jesus Christ. That's what Steve Egley did for me. Who are you doing that for? Can you turn to somebody and say, look at me. Now, now notice, this is not about ego, folks. (laughs) Because it's dangerous to say, look at me. See if I'm following Jesus and follow Jesus my example as I follow him. You've ever done, played follow the leader? It's really fun. We should do it right now. <laughs> you get the whole church up and walk around the room and you know, see we, how we do it following the leader and see what some people do and some people don't. It, it's kind of funny, but, well, but it's not funny when we're talking about follow my example as I follow the example of Jesus Christ. Have you followed someone who was following Jesus? It's probably... What brought you into a relationship with Jesus, if you think about it? Somebody there was an example, and you said, whoa, I like that. I want that. And so you pursued it. Or I should say, Jesus pursued you. (laughs) 
Paul says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. In Ephesians 5.1, Philippians 3.17, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. So he, Paul is saying, look, follow me, follow us, and follow anyone else who's following Jesus. 2 Thessalonians 3, 7, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you. We weren't lazy. We worked for Jesus. Follow our example. 1 Timothy 4, verse 12, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. So should I point to some young people? You, you can be an example to us old folks. <laughs> That's what he's saying to Timothy. Titus, in everything, set them an example by doing what is good in your teaching. Show integrity and seriousness. Have you helped someone else to become like Jesus Christ? Have you spent the time, the energy, lived in front of them, let them even in a sense live with you in life so that they could see Jesus in you? That's the third. And then the fourth level, <laughs> this is the level of maturity. I trained another how to make disciples. Have you done that? Have you trained somebody else how to train someone else who trains someone else? That's what Paul talked about with Timothy. Then Jesus came to them and said, Matthew 28, it's the great commission. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I taught you, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. Are you training people how to make disciples? How to teach somebody else how to obey Jesus? How to become like Jesus? So how would you grade yourself? Level one, I heard about Jesus and I believe. Level two, I followed someone who was following Jesus. Level three, I helped someone else to become like Jesus. Or level four, I trained another how to make disciples disciples. Guess what? What Jesus wants is for every single one of us to be at level four. What the writer of Hebrews says is too many of us are still at level one. And therefore we need milk, baby food, until we start doing the work of a disciple. <clears throat> What is a disciple? And I don't know where I'm at in the outline. Good luck, Mike. <laughs> what, what is a disciple? Remember the story? Jesus is at the lake, and he's been spending some time with some fishermen. <laughs> These are rough guys. They're not trained, <laughs> not very learned. They sure probably were slow of ears. And, and what does Jesus say to them? He says, come, follow me, and I will make you Fishers of men. I like the story because they get up, leave their fathers, follow Jesus. You see, there's actually three little things that are happening here. A disciple is one who first follows Jesus. That involves the head. What did Jesus say? Come, follow me. There's a choice that we make, thought we think it out. Secondly, a disciple is one who is being changed by Jesus. What does he say? I will make you into something. You come follow me and I'm going to do something inside of you that's going to make you different. And then thirdly, a disciple is committed to the mission of Jesus Christ. And he says, you will become fishers of men. In fact, if you want to, it's a little help to remember that. It's the head that says, I will come follow. It's the heart that says, I'm going to be changed. And it's the hands that will be used to make people fishers, to make us into fishers of men. 
Well, are you growing? Are you growing more like Jesus? And are you helping someone else to grow more like Jesus? Proverbs 29, verse 1. A person is destroyed not simply because he errs, but because he becomes stubborn when he is rebuked and will not repent. What is needed is repentance and patience to learn to do right. Now here's what I'd like to challenge you to do this week. Does everybody have a Bible? If you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles um, around here uh, in, in some under the chairs. Take one, okay? Or ask your neighbor for theirs. But I want you to take your Bible this week, and I would like you to read Ephesians 4, 25 through 32. Ephesians 4, 25 through 32. If you're on milk, just read it. But if you want more than milk, I want you to read it and say, Jesus, what do I need to apply out of this text? <coughs> Ephesians 4, 25 through 32. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So where are you in your spiritual development? I've given you one measurement. Let me give you one other. Number one, are you dead in sin? That means you have not accepted Christ's death as payment for your sin. And there are a lot, and there are a lot of people we know. who say, well, I'm good enough, God's going to accept me. Well, that means you're dead in sin. <laughs> because there is no good enough line you realize that God, thank God, does not grade on a curve. If he graded on a curve, oh my. Because isn't that kind of what we're saying? You know, well, you, if, you're, if you're good enough, you're going to get in. So where's the point where you're not good enough? Do, do, do you know where that line is? What if you're just on the other side of it? I mean, just, just missing? Well, here's the bad news. Everyone's on the other side of it. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, all fail. Except for the gift of God through Jesus Christ that opens the door of heaven for us. It's a gift from him. It's not something we can earn by somehow being good enough. So are you dead in sin? Number two, are you a babe in Christ? A new believer with excitement but not much knowledge. <laughs> Making a lot of noise. <laughs> Number three, are you a child in Christ? You know Jesus and you are growing, but like most children, you're a little bit selfish. Children? What do I get for Christmas? It's about them. Or are you an adolescent in Christ? You're learning to serve others, you're zealous for God, and you're becoming independent, but you're a little bit of a pain too. <laughs> or are you spiritually mature? You've become parents in Christ, intentionally reproducing and making disciples. Which one are you? Are you growing as Christ's disciple? It's interesting. Sometimes the offering plate tells us whether we're growing 
You know what? The offering plate tells us whether we're growing. Because it tells us whether we trust God or not. It tells us, not me, it tells you about yourself, whether you believe God's going to meet your needs according to his riches and glory. Whether what you have has come from him or you believe it's come from yourself. Whether you trust him to meet your needs or whether you don't. Whether you're going to live in fear. I mean, there's all kinds of things that you can test yourself on when that offering plate comes by. Here's another way that we also give you a test each Sunday, and that is, do you believe that God answers prayer? Do you believe that God cares about you? And are, do you trust his body to help minister to you? You see, the tear-off. To our guests, we do a tear-off. And it's right there in your worship bulletin. Please take it out now and rip it off. And if you have something that you would be willing to share with us that we could support you in prayer, I would encourage you to put that in that offering plate. It's another statement for you. It helps you test how much you believe in Jesus Christ. Today, if you need to make a commitment to go to another level, you pick the level you're at. You're the baby, you're the child, you're the adolescent, you're spiritually mature. Wherever you're at, if you need to go to another level and you want to share that with us so we can pray with you for that, I'd encourage you to do that. The worship team's going to come and then the ushers are going to receive the offering and we're going to sing a song, I Surrender. It'll be new to most of you and you're welcome to listen or you're welcome to join in. Once we've taken the offering, I am going to invite you to stand and to move into a, an attitude of surrender. Worship team, please. We're move into an attitude of surrender to Jesus Christ. Lord God, I pray that we would not be afraid to examine ourselves and see where we're at in our relationship with you. I pray that we would be honest. I pray that we would not have lazy ears, God, but that we would hear what you've been saying today. Please, Jesus, blank everything out that was from Bill and only let your word speak truth to each one of us. Teach us to be teachers. Help us to desire the meat of your word. And Lord, if we're still babies needing milk, like the writer of Hebrews says, then help us, Lord, to get past the milk and to start growing and modeling and discipling and equipping and training others. Help us to keep growing as your disciples. In Jesus' name, amen.